ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to the 2018 Rochester High School AP Government, Rochester Sentinel School Board debate slash discussion. We welcome everybody who's here and our audience, I'm sure, of millions on the internet. We appreciate everybody spending some time with us this evening. We'd like to open tonight's uh, gathering with sophomore Haley Wilson uh, singing the National Anthem. Rochester School Board candidates to introduce themselves, uh, their ideas, an exchange of ideas, and we hope in, in an enjoyable and respectful manner. A little bit about the format of the evening before we introduce our, our candidates and our panelists. Um, each candidate will get a two-minute opening statement, and then each of our four panelists will ask two questions for a total of eight, and then each candidate will get a two-minute close, closing statement. We have drawn for speaking orders, so it'll be kind of a rotating basis. Uh, so as you speak first with the first question, you'll rotate to the back of the order and then work your way through. So you have a, a, a different speaking order, but I think we've got it handled up here in terms of what that will look like. Um, and then at the end, um, we'll dismiss and, and hopefully be done in, in about an hour and a half is, is the idea. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, Rochester AP class uh, students. Uh, we have Mr. Adam Brown, Mr. Sarah Rohr, Mr. Caleb Hames, and our timekeepers out front, Mr. Jerry Plummer and Mr. Wes Scobie, and then from the Rochester Sentinel, Mr. Bill Wilson. I was speaking with Bill, and we believe this is almost 20 years uh, of debates sponsored in part between the Sentinel and <coughs> Rochester High School, so we appreciate uh, cooperation in conjunction with the Sentinel. Now for our candidates. Uh, we have Ms. Jen Mrs. Jennifer Smith, Mr. Joe Murphy, Mr. Tom Swank, Mr. David Dahlquist, Mr. Fred McLaughlin, Mr. Kyle McLaughlin, and Mrs. Gloria Carvey. A little bit about the race that's coming up. Uh, Tom Swank and Fred McLaughlin are competing for the one spot of the Richland Township. The other candidates are competing for uh, the at-large, and there are three open spots between the five candidates. So, without further ado, uh, we'll start with our uh, opening statements, and Mrs. Jennifer Smith will lead us off. Thank you, and thank you for having us tonight, and thank you for coming out. My name is Jennifer Smith, and public education has always been important to me. My parents were both public educators, and I graduated from Rochester High School in 1996. As a valedictorian of that class, I have a quote in the yearbook, and it said that my goal was to make a difference in the life of a child. So I've used that as my guiding philosophy. I graduated with a bachelor's, with bachelor's in science with elementary education and taught for several years, and then four years ago chose to run for school board, believing that I could bring my skills and time and talents to help in that way. I've been an active board member 
I was secretary for the three years. I have been the policy chair, and I'm continuing my education with um, the Indian School Board Association, as well as working locally with the Fulton County Leadership Academy as a graduate and working with the businesses and entities within Fulton County. I've brought knowledge from a parent and teacher perspective, but along the way have learned about school finance, bond projects, the legislative process, labor laws as they relate to education, and the full scope of this big but really important job. It's been my honor to be able to serve. Volunteering is very important in my life. I am a CASA, which is a court-appointed special advocate, so I work on behalf of a child or children in the court system. I'm a part of the Fulton County Youth Leadership Academy board and serve as the student liaison. I'm the president of the Fulton County Women's Giving Circle, which is part of the Northern Indiana Community Foundation, an active member of Tri Kappa, my church, a participant in Zebra Zone, a past president of Columbia PTO. But Rochester schools are most important to me because of my four kids. My husband, Doug, and I have a senior, a freshman, a fifth grader, and a four month old. So we've been part of Rochester schools for a long time and will be for a long time. We also have navigated the special education, education system. And we know that there are exciting and things ahead for RCSC and some challenges. And I would like to be a part of that. Good evening. Um, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Wilson and Sentinel for uh, coming and hosting this debate of the Rochester Community Schools and also the uh, panelists over there. Um, my name is Joe Murphy. I am uh, honored to be able to run uh, for a seat on the Rochester School Board. I have lived in Fulton County my entire life other than when I attended college. I am a graduate of Ball State University with a uh, bachelor's, in science, bachelor's of Science in Marketing. Um, after graduating, I moved back to Rochester, uh, married my wife Kristen, and have been a resident of the Rochester community for seven years. Um, I have been a board, past board member on the Fulton County United Way. Um, I was also involved in the schools as a sixth grade boys basketball coach at RMS. Um, and I'm also a graduate of the uh, Fulton County Leadership Academy. Um, as the uh, parent of a three-year-old son and the husband uh, of a wife that teaches in the Rochester School <coughs> Corporation, uh, education definitely uh, holds a special place uh, for me. Uh, I currently am a, a commercial loan officer at Alliance Bank in Winnemac, Indiana. Um, I typically, on a day-to-day -day basis, I look, uh, look over financial statements, budgets, and uh, go over, you know, people's balance sheets. And so that's typically what I do as a commercial loan officer. Um, I believe that uh, being an effective board member requires one to collaborate, listen, and think outside of the box. Um, I think uh, for all students to succeed, we need that in a board member. Um, and, and I think, you know, having the discussion to, to debate between the board to come up with the best solution is the best thing. Um, I can tell you I'm a young and energetic business professional. I'm hoping to give back and contribute to the community myself and my family live in. Good evening. Uh, my name's Tom Schwank, and I'd like to uh, thank Mr. Stasiak and the AP government class and Rochester Sentinel for hosting tonight's debate. I'd also like to thank WROI Radio and RTC for TV uh, for the continued support for the uh, school system. We're so fortunate to have uh, you know, a daily newspaper, radio station, television station, and a community this size. And that really helps get our message out here at the school. Uh, currently, I'm a board member. I've uh, been a board member eight years, uh, past president three years. I've lived in the community all my life. I graduated right here at Rochester High School. Uh, I have two degrees from Purdue University. And I currently farm with my son in Fulton, Kosciuszko, and Miami counties. I'm married to Charlie. She's a uh, PE teacher here at uh, Columbia and Riddle Elementary. Uh, this will be her 40th year of teaching. So I've been around teachers for a while. I also have two children. Uh, they're both Rochester graduates. Uh, Brock is my son and his wife Tasha have two sons, Tommy and Brant. And uh, they're both students here at Columbia. And my daughter, Abby, uh, she's in her eighth year of teaching, and her husband lives with her husband, Brad, in West Lafayette. 
and she's an elementary teacher. Hey, I'm currently a member of the board of directors of Surrey Solution Cooperative. Uh, Surrey Solution is a farmer owned ag cooperative, slice feed, uh, fertilizer, fuel, LP, and we are in uh, 35 counties in Indiana and Michigan, and we have uh, sales over $800 million. So, uh, and I've been past president of uh, the Richland Township Community Association and uh, spearheaded the <coughs> building out at the museum, the uh, Richland Center Memorial Hall. Thank you. Good evening. My uh, name is David Goffles, and thank you, uh, everyone who's involved with this, for the opportunity to speak. Um, I grew up in Kokomo. I went to Wabash College, got a bachelor's degree there. I have a master's degree from Indiana University in science education. I am a retired teacher. Um, I've lived here in Rochester for 24 years with my wife, Cheryl. My son, Noah, my daughter, Emma, graduated from high school uh, here, and they're both in college now, and they're doing really well. Uh, in my teaching 35 years, I was in a Grissom Middle School in the Penn Harris Madison School System in Mishawaka. I taught science and um, history, and I was also a football coach, track coach, and an academic coach there. Uh, in my time there, I was served on a lot of uh, curriculum committees, textbook adoption committees. I worked for a state committee on redo, uh, redoing history standards from this uh, middle school. I was also involved in editing some textbooks during my time uh, there. Um, my goals as far as why I wanted to run for school board, education is incredibly important. The job of the school board, anybody in the school system, is to make sure that all the students coming out have the skills to either enter the job market, go to college, go to trade school, go in the armed forces. It's our job to make sure they are ready. And everybody needs to be involved in that. The community, the schools, every, and the students and the families. It's an equal job for everybody to make sure we do the job of having our students come out well prepared. Thank you. Good evening. My name is uh, Fred McLaughlin, Jr. Um, I'd like to thank Mr. Stajak, the AP government class, the uh, Sentinel and RTC Channel 4. I was born and raised uh, in Rochester and reside in Richmond Township since 2001. I was a graduate of Rochester High School in 1996. I've since obtained an associate's degree in applied science from Ivy Tech. I for my education and leadership training through an REMC program called Relight. This program focuses on networking and cooperation at multiple levels for business professionals and leadership roles. My wife Shannon and I have been married for eight years. We are raising a blended family of four children. We have two boys in Rochester schools, Braxton, which is a junior, and Tarek, which is an eighth, grade, eighth grader. Our oldest son, Isaac, graduated from uh, Tippecanoe Valley in 2018, where our daughter Walt is a senior this year. I've been employed at Fulton County REMC since 2002. I've held the position of union steward for 13 years there. I advanced to line foreman in 2007. I've operated my own business, m and Irrigation Innovations Incorporated, since 2002. I serve local farmers in Fulton and surrounding counties. I'm actively involved in our community, both through my employment and on a personal level. I am currently president of Rochester Youth Baseball. I've held that position for two years in the past, along with other positions and I've returned to help this year to future the success of the program. I spent many volunteer hours coaching multiple youth sports for the last 13 years. These include baseball, basketball, and football. I have helped, I've helped spearhead the middle school baseball program that we started last year. My goal in running for this position is to bring a bright new insight, views, and growth. I am focused on furthering our school system as a whole, benefiting the administration, faculty and staff, but most of all, our students. Good evening. I as well would like to thank the Sentinel, Tony, the AP government class for inviting me to participate in tonight's debate. I also 
want to thank all of you for showing up and caring about the school and the community. My name is Kyle McLaughlin, and I'm excited to be running for the Rochester School Board. I'm a 2001 graduate of Rochester High School. I'm a 2006 graduate of Ball State University. I'm married to my wife, Megan. She is a fourth grade teacher at Riddle Elementary. We together have two sons, a kindergartner, his name is Mason, and a three, well, an almost three-year-old named Maddox. As a husband to a teacher and a parent to a student, education is a top priority to me. I currently work for Farm Bureau Insurance as a field claim representative and have for 12 years. My job requires many attributes that, that work parallel with being a school board member. Listening, communication, managing resources, negotiations, and most importantly, being active within your role. I've been very active in our community and within the school system as well. I was able to coach basketball at Rochester Middle School for 11 years in all three levels, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Currently, I work for WRY on Friday nights, uh, calling the football games, which is a lot of fun, and I appreciate being able to see our football team succeed. As well in the community, I'm an executive board member on the Rochester Youth Baseball League. I'm also an executive board member on the Nick Patterson Community and Scholarship Fund. Within my role on the Nick Patterson Community and Scholarship Fund, I am able to be out in the community raising money, which we are able to give back to high school graduating seniors. It is in my personal opinion, serving on the school board is the utmost community give back that you can give, and I want to give back by serving on this board to a school that gave a lot to me. I look forward to hearing your questions tonight and giving thoughtful answers. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Gloria Carvey. I want to thank you all for having us here tonight so that we can explain a little bit about why we want to have this very honored position of school board member. Um, I am running for one of the three at-large school board seats. Currently, I am the site director of Rochester's Ivy Tech site that is over at the Rochester Learning Center. I have worked for Ivy Tech, which is, uh, used to be called Indiana Vocational Technical College, for 33 years in a variety of capacity, capacities. I originally came to Ivy Tech as an instructor. But then I had good fortune and had a lot of interesting <coughs> challenges and I became the Dean of Student Affairs for the Kokomo region. I am a lifelong resident of Fulton County, graduating from Rochester High School, then going to Purdue to be a high school teacher. After graduation from Purdue, I married a local farmer, Bruce Carvey, and started teaching high school. During this time, I had my two daughters, Lisa and Stacy, who both lived here in Rochester. Then in 1985, I started teaching both math and English at Ivy Tech and Logansport. Working at Ivy Tech afforded me so many diverse learning opportunities, from making and balancing budgets to supervisory roles for entire departments. In the last seven years, as Ivy Tech's site director here at Rochester, my charge by my chancellor was to build relationships in the community. I have done this by participating in a number of leadership positions. I have been the past president of the chamber board, uh, and I am currently a chamber board member today. I was for four years Lake Manitou Association board member. I am uh, the current secretary of the Fulton County Tourism Board. In 2015, I was president of the Noon Kiwanis Club and current board member, and I'm the club secretary. You can probably hear a theme here. They always like me to be the secretary. I have been the secretary of the Fulton County Youth Leadership Board and presenter at several of the meetings, secretary of the Fulton County Promise Indiana Advisory Board as well. Okay, that concludes our opening statements. As we begin our question round, remind each panelist, we'll ask uh, two questions total for a total of eight questions, and these responses are one minute uh, for the candidates. First question belongs to Mr. Adam Brown. Thank you, Mr. Stacey. As many of you know, one of the many responsibilities of the school board is dealing with budgets. 
What are your budgeting priorities, and do you believe any one thing takes priority? For this round of questioning, Joe Murphy will start us off. Yeah, so I guess my opinion on, on the whole budgeting, um, you know, I think it's important to make sure that the funds are, are there in the budget for any, any needs that may arise for the students here. Um, I, I think the students here at Rochester deserve the very best, and I think it's important as a school board that uh, we make sure that uh, the, the funds are there and we're not uh, excessively spending on, spending on things that we don't really need that aren't going to benefit the students. Um, as far as a priority, <coughs> I think a priority of mine would, would probably be um, making sure that we have the funding for uh, the uh, maintenance. You know, I think uh, the school's been around a long time and, and improving that and making sure that uh, all, the, all the necessary um, technologies and, and functions of the building are there. Could you repeat the question again? So as you know, many of the responsibilities of the school board is dealing with budgets, what are your budgeting priorities, and does any one thing take priority? Okay, thank you. Um, we started out uh, a few years ago setting priorities on uh, getting our buildings maintenance in order. So we went through and did a comprehensive uh, evaluation of all the buildings, and uh, we put priorities on uh, what needs attention first. So we have been working at this for several years now, and we've come a long ways. Uh, first, uh, going toward the roofs, uh, you know, your building's only as good as its roof, so we have uh, new roofs. Uh, as far as uh, the educational aspects, uh, we're working on uh, preschool now. We have two, pre uh, two preschool classes now, and we're finding out that the uh, Early uh, intervention in bringing youth, uh, getting them to the educational process makes learning come easier. So the time they get to kindergarten, they're ready to go. Noah's operating at first grade levels. Okay, thank you. Uh, budgeting is uh, very important to the school system. I uh, just read that the state has changed some of the things with their funds, so it's going to be really important to have your plans ahead, know what you need currently, but you also got to think about the future and what you're going to need to do later. Uh, some of the things have already been worked on is the repairs of buildings. I know buses are always, upkeep is always a concern, but you also got to consider you have to have the money to have the programs to uh, supply the needs of the students. And the state is always coming up with new things that they want the students to have. On the budget, I guess education would be uh, my number one budget and I to make sure that our kids are getting the proper education that they need. Uh, books to all the students would be another, another one. I know that we have some kids that don't need to take some books home. Um, I feel like that's, that should be important in today's uh, learnings. Um, teachers, I want to make sure that we have enough budgeted money for teachers to go around. Then obviously what everybody else touched on, we got the maintenance of the buildings, uh, the maintenance of the grounds, and just the general upkeep on everything that we have from buses to the, to the maintenance of the fields and all that stuff. Dave kind of touched on it quickly, but we are facing uh, New challenges coming in January. Uh, five budgets are being squished to three. Um, that is a big deal. Uh, you've got to be fiscally responsible to not spend money from a different budget when money is allocated elsewhere. Budgeting priorities, number one is education, and it will always be education with me. Um, we need, four years ago on this debate, they talked about an art teacher, and they asked, you know, what are we going to do with an art teacher? I don't believe that's been addressed yet. We've got to find a way to get our kids the best possible education, and that starts with teachers, plain and simple. We've got to find a way to get more teachers in the classrooms. I know budgeting, you know, the numbers will only let you do so much, but education is number one. You've got to have maintenance as well, but I will start and will always start with education. 
Well, budgets tend to be finite numbers, so you have to stay within the budget. And what we do have coming up here in January is the streaming from five down to three. So we have to pay close attention to how we are spending out of this, out of these funds. Um, I also, my priority would always be, um, you know, we got to have the buildings. There's no doubt about it. But it's the instructors. I, I feel they're the worker bees. Uh, they're the ones that make all the difference for the children. And so we have to invest in our instructors. Okay, our next question well, comes from Jim. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Oh. But as has been mentioned, a major change in budgeting will be coming our way in January where we have five funds that are taken to three funds. That does not necessarily mean less money. It means that money will be allocated differently. We have been very blessed by this board and previous boards to be very mindful of fiscal management, and that's why we have been able to do things like maintain our buildings, like have the HVAC systems repaired and the roofs done, and those kinds of very good stewardship that has been done. Another avenue of good stewardship has been that we have um, a donation from a community member who donated for all new LED lights. Well, then not only do we not have to pay for the LED lights, but that lowers our energy costs. So we have been mindful and will continue to be mindful of that. Our biggest priority is anything that would directly impact the students. And so that would be programming and teachers. And we do look at that very carefully and I would continue to look at that. Okay. Our next question comes from Sarah Rohr and the first response goes to Tom Swank. We as students have witnessed an increase in drug use within our school. Um, how would you implement new policies to combat drug use, such as vaping and juuling? Okay, yes, uh, drug use is a big problem countywide. I mean, we're seeing it in our jails. Uh, education is an important part. Uh, we have to, uh, you know, give people the opportunity to have other alternatives to be active. Training and, and how to spot uh, drug use from students, you know, with their teachers. Uh, any kind of uh, public awareness. We know a lot of peer pressure is put on kids for using drugs, so we got to find other alternatives uh, to occupy their time. And it's definitely a problem. Uh, we'll to do more, paying attention to the uh, way kids act see you know possibility of uh, even having random drug search with dogs uh, that's a possibility too that is going on so uh, it is definitely a problem and uh, we'll try to address it from many different avenues thank you uh, whatever school system you're in today <clears throat> there's always the drug problems and things like that and one of the best ways to deal with that is educating your students on um, what can happen with drug use, what things can lead to, but trying to get them to be interested in other things that take up their time. And also, obviously, you've got to cooperate with the local police and things like that and figure out when you hear things are going on, try to deal with those. Um, I know for my daughter, unfortunately, she would graduate last year that there is a drug problem. And we obviously have to do something to change that and let it have less of an effect on our students. I feel like the teachers and the coaches are, are two of our biggest assets in this, in this combat against drugs. I feel like they play a vital role in developing our kids from all the way to kindergarten, all the way through. So good teachers, good coaches, um, and, and the leadership amongst our schools is, is very crucial. Um, yeah, the drug searches, that is a, that is a great option. Um, I, you know, their school is doing a random drug testing, it's happening. Um, but, but also I think one untapped asset is some of our students in our in our schools. I feel like we have some good students that are good leaders that if we could tap a program amongst them 
to uh, help combat it. Um, seems like sometimes students can get through better than other students to be able to drive home the message, you know. Just, just that bond amongst kids is, if you can get that unbreakable bond, I think that is, that is crucial to help some of the students that are in trouble. Within the policies that can be adapted, we can expand drug searches with dogs. We can um, reach out to the community with officers um, coming into the schools, helping out with the education process. But I think the expansion of the resource officer job is important. I think these kids, whether it's security or drugs, are completely defenseless. The more we can have a presence of a resource officer within a building or buildings, that's imperative. I think you catch it quicker, earlier, and it leads to a safer environment. A safer environment is a better education. Um, outside of the, you know, outside of that, you know, candidates have talked about educating within, you know, using, you know, coaches, teachers, having more people buy in other than administrators working on that as a whole. But I am in big favor of expanding the resource officer job and finding a way to get more of them in our buildings to help combat with drug and security problems. Addiction is serious in our community and in our schools. So we should not put our heads in the sand and think it doesn't happen here because it certainly does. And we do need to expand um, the root cause of why the addictions. We need to take a, a look at this. And as far as policies are concerned, we should be looking into more drug testing and things uh, along that line. Unfortunately, drug use is a big problem, and it's a problem that needs a multi-pronged approach to be able to address it. We've implemented some policies, and there are further ways to go. We have a school resource officer who has relationships with the students and that goes a far away. Education of the students, as others have mentioned, and building those relationships with teachers and coaches, they are on the front lines. Um, something else is the mental health aspect of it. And we have, in the last few years, expanded our mental health services that are available here for both our students and recently our staff. And that has been allocation of money by the board to be able to do that because we feel if you can't under address those underlying issues, then that leads to problems later on. And anything that I look at, I look at research driven, and that's a discussion for another day about random drug testing, but the research doesn't show that that is successful. So I am always one who is advocating for research driven policies. Yeah, I would say I'm a firm believer in the uh, education piece. I think uh, as, a, as a United States, we, we need to do more um, in educating our, our teenage youth about the, uh, the, the effects of drug use, um, and especially at an early age, it, it almost sets a, sets a path for you in your life uh, the earlier you get started. Um, I, I would say I'm also in favor of, of you know, the random dog uh, searches, and, and I do know as well that there are uh, some, some schools out there that are doing random drug testing, so I, you know, we need to do what we can to, uh, to, to try to help stop this epidemic. Um, I don't know that any of us know the right answer, but uh, I think all of us would agree that, that we need to do something, um, whether that's random, random drug testing, uh, education, whatever that is, we, we all need to be on board with that. Next question comes from Caleb Hames, and our first response goes to David Dalton. Athletics are a large part of our community. As such, I would like to ask your opinion on the recently enacted no-cut policy for middle school sports. How would you respond to claims that such a policy could harm turnouts for certain sports? Um, I happened to be in a corporation when I was teaching that um, for the sports like football and things like that, there was a no-cut policy. And it worked very well for us. Because we had a number, I'll speak of football because that's in track. We had a number of people that if there would have been cuts in middle school, they would probably never played in football in high school or run track. 
and some of our boys and girls were not very good in middle school, but they came out, they worked hard. And some, I can give you a couple of examples. We had some of our best all-state football players. They could hardly get on the field when they were middle schoolers, but they had the chance to play. They weren't cut. And um, it's just, I think it's really important to give uh, students a chance, every opportunity they want to in sports, to see what they can do, what they like, and how they can go forward with that. Uh, to touch on you, you think some kids might not come out. I, I would agree with that. Uh, it seems like, you know, we used to have some B-team sports where you could, you know, the competition was a little less. Um, so you had, you know, more opportunity for kids. But having, you know, foot, football is easier to hide on no cuts. Your other sports, it's harder to do. So then you get kids sitting on the bench a lot, and then parents are getting frustrated in the stands. I and mean, we've had a lot of kids leave doing, doing more travel sports. Um, I feel like it's taken away from some of our progress in the, in the sports world here at Rochester. Um, so, you know, as far as the no cuts go, I, I kind of oppose that in some sports, you know. I, I feel like, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity out here anymore, just, just not three sports that we used to have back, back when I was in high school. And, you know, I, I, like I said, I see frustration amongst parents, kids, on the fact that we are, you know, having some no-cut policy. I fully oppose the no-cut policy. I feel every kid that walks in our door is special in one way or another, whether it's science, math, English, the arts, they earn A's, they might strive for A's in that. We have kids that go out for sports that strive to be very good at sports. They put the time in, they work hard, and I feel they should be rewarded by making the team. That is a reward. I am not a fan of participation trophies. I think you need to earn it. And sometimes, I mean, unfortunately, the kids that get cut, it does stink. And I have not faced that yet with my kids, but personally, as a middle school coach through this program, when I was able to uh, coach here, we did have cuts. And I've had kids bounce back from cuts, come out again and make the team. And it meant way more to them. And for that, I think that's a fantastic opportunity for a kid to strive to get better. Thank you. Very controversial, uh, the no-cut policy. And um, I am kind of of the opinion that, especially in middle school, that children need an opportunity to learn the game. And they are development. I mean, when you look out at a middle school group, you see men, women, girls, and boys. You see all stages of development. They need the opportunity to learn the sport so that they, when they get older, if they go on to play, they may be very good players. The no-cut policy does apply to the middle school, not to the high school, just to clarify that. Um, it is based on child development, just like Mrs. Carvey said, that it is an acknowledgement that there is a big difference in development throughout the middle school years. What the no-cut policy is not is a guarantee of playing time. That it is a guarantee that if you come out and you work hard, and you meet the academic requirements and you meet the team rules that you will be able to learn the sport. I, I feel like it actually clarifies playing time a lot more than in the past. It is clear in the policy that this is not a guarantee of playing time. It is a guarantee to be a part of the team. And so therefore, a student that may not have as much talent yet or may be just learning the sport, they may not play in any games. We'll have to see. And if they are willing to put the work in for the 200 hours instead of the 20 hours of the games, then they can be part of the team. As a uh, former uh, sixth grade uh, basketball coach, I can tell you I'm kind of I'm kind of on the fence on this one. Um, I, I, I do believe that uh, each student, as they uh, are, are going through adolescence, that they, they deserve an opportunity. Um, I, I think my, my opinion on it would be that, you know, in sixth grade, we do have the A and the B team, um, so I, I'm not so opposed to it in that situation, uh, 
but then when you hit the uh, seventh and eighth grade and there is no B team, I, I think that's where um, the conflict arises because then you have uh, one coach with you know however many kids come out, and and it just becomes kind of a nightmare for that coach to to go through basically plays um, anything anything like that. It, it's more kids to watch and take care of. As Jenny stated, uh, this we're talking about the no cut policy that uh, the board passed, and this is just for the middle school. And uh, I'm I'm for cuts at high school. But we're finding out that, uh, that you know kids are still learning the sport, and also they are not guaranteed to play. And they may be on the team all year, but they may not even play a game. And they have to understand that going in. And that's part of the deal in this. Um, it's a learning experience for them. They can get better. Uh, my personal experience: I uh, had a classmate, seventh grade, didn't make the team. My senior year, we had an undefeated regular season, and he ended up going to Vanderbilt and playing for Purdue. So things can change. Next question, Bill Wilson. First response goes to Fred and Law. Excuse me. Is that, is that on? Yep. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Do you believe Rochester school teachers should carry the weapons in class? Why or why not? Well, that's a very, very debatable question. Um, you know, I believe that if, uh, if a person is trained to carry a bar firearm, I get, I, I'm not opposed to it. You know, there's a lot of people in our community that that are trained. You know, we're, we're from a rural community. There's, you know, a lot of asset to it. Um, yeah, every, should everybody just feel free to walk in and get a gun permit and be able to, be able to carry a gun? I don't believe so because, you know, sometimes they don't always know the right way to handle that weapon. Um, but, I, but I feel like in our school district, some of our teachers that are outdoors and are outdoors be women. I mean, I feel like they would be responsible enough to carry a weapon. Likewise, I agree. I, uh, I feel the training is there. We have a great resource in the school. Skeeter is our resource officer. He can train. Carries a weapon, I believe, and uh, he can train teachers. I don't believe all teachers should carry weapons, but I do believe the ones that want to be trained, that want to understand that task, if you have to use the weapon, what that means. Again, it's about defending our kids. And if we've got people within our school corporation that want to do it, I'm absolutely for it. We have the one skeeter. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and uh, uh, Skeeter cannot be everywhere, so if there are teachers who desire to learn how to handle professionally guns, I think that this is the best, you know, option. School safety, again, is a huge issue with a very multi-pronged approach, and we are blessed with a very active safety committee and um, a, a school resource officer and a board that's been supportive of different sorts of safety protocols, including our entrances to our buildings and other kinds of training that we've gone through recently. So I, uh, I agree that we should continue on with our ALICE training with our SRO. I know it was mentioned earlier about adding another school resource officer that is definitely on the table. As far as teachers carrying weapons, I think that is something that we should delve deeper into and perhaps on an extremely limited basis with people with very specific training. We, for instance, we have a principal who has served in the armed forces that is a different level of training than somebody who knows how to go out and hunt. And so in some limited instances, I would be willing to look into that. I too would be uh, in favor of, of allowing uh, the teachers to, to carry a, a handgun or a firearm. Um, I, I do believe that that would require um, a lot of training. And, and I guess I, I would say that I'm probably more inclined to say that I would like to see somebody that would maybe be in the office in each building that would be uh, 
you know, trained on how to handle that firearm. Um, you know, that, that's probably more of the ideal situation that you have an office staff person that uh, is trained. Um, but that's that's kind of my stance. Over the past few years, uh, we've taken several steps, so we hope we don't have to ever have someone carry a gun. Uh, we've increased the, the security at all the buildings, uh, locked entrances, uh, bollards at the front doors, that, and uh, added school resource officer skeeter. We'll, I would never want to make a teacher carry a gun, but we do have teachers that would be qualified. That's okay because. That may be the first line of defense should we have some shooting event. Because it does take, you know, the police five, ten minutes to get there. And by then a lot of damage could be done. But I wouldn't make anyone wear or carry a gun. It'd have to be somebody that's willing to do it, that's trained, and is comfortable with that. Thank you. I agree that there probably should be in the future if it's, uh, the school board decides that there should be some teachers that carry weapons, but it should be very, very limited. Um, I was, a couple years ago when I was a teacher, the discussion came up whether a teacher would be willing to carry a gun if they were asked. And I was one of them that was approached about it because I shot on a rifle team and all kinds of things in high school and college. So I know what I'm doing with a weapon, but you really have to make sure of the training and make sure that it's a very controlled situation if you're going to do that. And unfortunately, with, our, with what's going on, it may have to happen. Okay, Adam Brown leads off our second round of questions, and Kyle McLaughlin gets the first response. In light of the possibility of many rural schools closing and consolidating, how would you go about attracting more students to Rochester? Would you implement specific policies, bus routes, advertisements? That starts, excuse me, that starts with our school being a model school. We need to be in our community. We need to make our school the school to the others around us. When you do that, you will start to attract more students from other schools. Our school in the last couple years has not been that school. We've had a lot of issues go on, and unfortunately, I get to travel to other communities. It's not good, it's not good feedback. What's going on at Rochester? Well, we've gotta be a model school. We've gotta take it up a couple notches, and then kids will come. We've gotta be able to compete and beat the Culbers, the Arguses, and the Castons. We are a bigger school. We have more enrollment. We have more funding. We, we should be able to draw those students to us. We're losing those our students to them, and that is a huge problem. Recruitment is, a, is very essential, and one of the ways that we can do is, is being, as you said, Kyle, a model, a model of a school, and that means programming. We have to have excellent program. We have programming. We have to be noted for that. We have to also get out of the newspapers for controversial items. And so being a model school is important. Having the best of programming, having people think, wow, I really want to go there because I can get a jump on college. That is really important. Since the state legislature has changed and you can send your student to any public school without having to pay transfer, this has been something on the docket for a while. And Adam, you mentioned sending buses, and we do do that. We send buses into other corporations' areas and to have their students be able to come. So we do have transfer students like that. And I agree that programming is definitely part of what we can offer. We, of the ones that have been mentioned, we are the school that has a lot of businesses around. We have a very good internship program that we are growing, and that is a big attraction. We have a lot of dual credit opportunities that maybe other local schools can't. And our marketing is something that is a goal and is one of our goals that we have put forward as a board for this coming year. 
Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I mean, I think, I think the programs is probably the number one thing. Um, but I also think, you know, there, there could be a lot more marketing done for uh, Rochester schools. I'm not sure. I, I haven't seen much. Um, and I, I think that's probably an area that we lack. Um, as far as programs, I think Rochester uh, School Corporation offers a lot of good programs for students. Um, I think, you know, resources, I think we've got a lot of good resources here. You know, from a, from a marketing major, I would say that's probably what I see lacking the most. I do know that we're, we're doing the school buses. I also know that other schools are sending their school buses here. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely a, a huge problem. Uh, but I, I would just like to see, you know, the administration marketing, you know, what we have to offer here at Rochester. We have a lot of great things going on in this school system. Uh, last year, the class of uh, or the class 2017 had 672 college credits earned during their senior year. And this past year, 744 college credits were earned. Uh, we currently have 170 students enrolled in our internship. It's work-based learning and education professional classes. And we're currently partnering with 107 local business partners with student placements. So we're looking at the workplace and, and what kind of worker do they want? Not everybody's going to go to college. So we have the trades, you know. But we also want to make sure that they're on a, if they're on a college path, they get there and they're well prepared. So just kind of blowing on our own horn about what we have here. We're a great school. Uh, we go to uh, school board conferences and they tell us, you know, what great things are doing. It's, well, hey, we're already doing that. So I'm very proud of what we're doing here. And, uh, and people come here and see what we have. And it's a good thing. It, it's all about PR, public relations. I worked in a school system, Penn, High school for that one was 4,000 now, but it wasn't that way when I started there. About 1,500. They were PR monsters. They bragged about everything they did that was good. I remember South Bend Tribune, our school, we'd send stuff into them all the time. They said, We're limited to you to once every two months. We're tired of hearing about you. But you've got to, as he said, toot your own horn. Last year I was at Penn. They gained 200 students from other corporations. And it's because they tried, they went out there, they advertised, they did everything they could to say how good they are. But they also had the programs. You gotta have the programs that attract the people, but you gotta brag about yourself. This is a good school. We've got problems just like everybody else. But you've got to use your PR. I feel like the recruiting of the kids uh, starts with uh, good academics and uh, good opportunities uh, as far as to the, what classes they can take and that's good. good teachers and good coaches. Um, and then I would, you know, <coughs> further build on, you know, what does our facilities look like, you know, how do our fields look, how is everything maintained? I mean, because I, you know, going to different schools, you know, you pull into different schools and you look at their facilities and you, you kind of feel yourself comparing them to what we have and I think that's, that's the first thing they see when they pull in is what does the facilities look like, you know. Man, it'd be nice to play on that football field or that baseball diamond or something like that. So that's kind of my stance on it. Sarah Rohr gets the next question. And Gloria Carvey gets the first response. Over the years, our high school has operated under a new tech system. Do you support this system or believe it can be detrimental? Uh, please explain your stance. The new tech system has, I'm, I'm trying to think exactly how long that's been, but it was very inspiring to my president of our college, uh, Dr. Snyder at that time. In fact, he was so impressed with it in the ambassador program that he um, said that all new tech highs could have six free credits uh, because of it. And he, when he came here and the ambassadors took him around, um, he said, this is what it's all about. When students can speak to their love of the school. And uh, so the new tech high and the project-based learning is the wave of the future in so much of what we do.
We are a new tech school. We're also kind of a hybrid because as far as I understand, we are still the first, the only, excuse me, school that is fully new tech within the corporation with no alternative. So obviously we have classes that perhaps don't fit the exact new tech format. I'm somebody who definitely, when looking at decisions and at policies and paying for new tech would be a budget item for sure, wants to make a research-based decision. And so that was another of our goals for this past year is we asked the high school um, and the administration, what is the value of new tech? And it came back a resounding yes, that the staff was in favor of new tech, that the administration was in favor of new tech, that they still feel the framework is useful and a, uh, appropriate and beneficial for students. Yeah, I, I believe new tech is the, uh, the, the way of the future. Um, I, would, I would actually like to see uh, the corporation uh, use it more to their advantage. Um, you know, being a one-to-one -one school, I think uh, e-learning is, is, a, is a big deal. And I think that, uh, that that's something, you know, being a new tech school, having the, the technology that we have, you know, I think that's something that we need to look at and incorporate. Yeah, I, I would I would say that I, I am in favor of new tech. When we first started new tech a few years ago, it, it did have some bumps in the road. It's, it's kind of hard to get everybody on board and change. But as Jenny said, uh, we've done some evaluation of it, and everybody's on board now. Uh, things are going well. Uh, we're getting reports back from graduates that have gone to college and. They do group projects, and they're usually the only ones that know what they're doing in the group. So they usually have to end up leading the group. So we're producing a student that's uh, ready for college. Uh, and, you know, this has been uh, here quite a while, and we've had a lot of people come here to see how we're doing it. So we're, we're setting the stage for other people, and, uh, and we need to uh, promote what we have because it's doing very well for us right now. I'm definitely in favor of the <clears throat> new tech, and I'm just going to use my um, son and daughter as examples. They're both in college, and when you get to college, you run into a lot of group work, projects, and things like that, and they've done very well, and it was because of the training they got here. Um, it was a big advantage to them, and they actually, as he was saying, they actually did better than some of the students they were with because they had that experience of working in groups, talking, working together, cooperation. So I'm in favor of as much of that we can do, it need, it's needed. Yeah, I'm in favor of the new tech. I, I think it is, is the future going forward. Um, just as long as it's administrated in the right way, um, I feel like the group work is great as long as everybody puts all their participation in that group. Um, so as students, you need to make sure you're, you're involving everybody, getting everybody active in it, because that's when it is going to work to the best. Um, if everybody isn't involved, yeah, I, I can see where it could be detrimental to some students. Um, but back to, you know, we need to get the teachers on board. It, says, it sounds like they are getting there. And just keep adapting and tweaking it to make it, you know, run very well for us. I as well am a favor of new tech. Many members in the community are in favor of new tech. I've been out asking that question. I think part of new tech, the extension of new tech, is e-learning. We're behind there. We need to get up to speed. I'm a big proponent of new or of e-learning. I think uh, we are one to one uh, across the board, and uh, it absolutely needs to be extended to e-learning. We need to lift the constraints on e-learning. Um, I've done a lot of research on that topic during my campaign, went into other school systems, I've been asking questions about it, and I want it, and I think many members of the community, teachers, and students want it. Um, the best feedback I did get on new tech was kids that have graduated, as Tom said, they're telling me they're ready for college, but not all kids go to college. We've also got to have other things, building trades, culinary, anything, and I everything we can offer to not just the college-bound kid, but the kid that's going into the workforce when he graduates. Caleb Haynes gets the next question. Jennifer Smith gets the first response. 
Teachers at all grade levels in our corporation are currently making less money than their experience warrants. How do you feel we could best close that pay gap? Or do you feel this is an issue at all? This is a huge issue, and it is a national issue. Part of it, they technically are not making less money than they were. However, less money is going home in the paycheck, and that's really what matters, let's face it. A major part of that has been health care costs. Health insurance costs have skyrocketed and the way that we reimburse public employees has skyrocketed for their health insurance. They used to only have to pay a dollar a paycheck and it's much, much, much more now. So that does t take down the actual real dollars. We also have a pretty big gap between our highest teacher and our lowest teacher and that is um, for a variety of reasons. There are some proposals in the state legislature looking on how to close the gap. I'll be very interested in what those are. All of the money that we use to pay teachers comes from the general fund, or the general fund comes from the state. So they are the ones in charge of dis dispersing that. They're looking at changing the funding formula, but we definitely need to look into that. Yeah, I, I think that is, uh, you know, being the husband of a, of a teacher, um, that is a huge issue. Um, and I think, you know, the first place to start is, is basically look at our, look at our administration. Um, you know, there's a there's a huge gap between you know what our administrators are making versus what our our teachers are making. Now I know you know being an administrator comes with with a lot more responsibility and a lot more headaches, um, but you know teachers teachers are the ones on the front lines. Um, they're the ones you know doing the grunt work. So you know I, I think you know you're right in the budget uh, the budget sense of it, but you know we we're also paying the, the administrators here at Rochester uh, very handsomely, so. Well, as Jenny said, uh, funding from the states are a problem. Uh, that's, this has been a tough issue for me because we try very hard to squeeze any dollar we can to direct back to the teachers. And we're limited there. Uh, and the drawback to this is that, uh, you know, we're gonna lose good teachers to the public uh, public employment because they find better jobs at higher pay and we don't want to see that. We want to be able to reward good teachers. Uh, a lot of that now we're trying to, you know, teacher evaluation. Uh, we can kind of see where our good teachers are and where some need improvement. So we work on that. But uh, yes, if we can talk to our legislators, uh, some kind of new funding formula uh, needs to happen, especially it seems like rural schools are getting hit the worst. Uh, we're losing a lot of money to charter schools. Most charter school money uh, goes to big cities, and so you know the rural rural schools are hurting there with those funds. <clears throat> uh, teachers definitely um, need higher pay, and it is affecting these students that are going to college. Very, it's very limited the number students that are going into teaching because they know what the pay scales are at the school. Um, and my, my kids know that, that kind of thing. But the money comes from the state. Um, we're going to have to just find some ways, as I was saying, to squeeze out money. And since they're combining some of the funds, maybe that will give some opportunity, but you got to be careful. you got to have money for the programs and everything like that. So with these new changes there might be some opportunity but again you've got to be very careful very wise about how you distribute it it would be very nice if you could raise those salaries a little bit which is something you have to look at closely the teacher's pay is a huge thing for what, for what they do and what they uh, get paid for it it's, yeah. it's a tough job so uh, you know, we just, we'll have to look at that budget, see what we can do, uh, work with them, you know. Uh, I, I negotiate contracts with the RNC, so it, it's hard. We, when we budget, you know, when we go in for negotiation, it's hard, you know, because we want, they want, so, you know, you got to find that common ground, work together to try to see what we can do and squeeze money where we can squeeze money to, to, to try to keep everybody happy. It's absolutely huge. It's unacceptable for teachers today having to work second jobs to make ends meet. They are professionals and it's time they're paid like a professional. I'm married to a teacher. 
I know what goes into her role. It's not a seven to three or an eight to three role. It's a lot. It's summertime, <coughs> morning, evening. I understand that with budgetary concerns, you can only pay what you can pay. But why not put the teachers first? Before we divvy out pie, let's pay the most important people we have in our buildings that are educating our kids. We want a top-notch education, we need top-notch teachers. To get top-notch teachers, you gotta pay them. I'm all for it. I will always be all for it. I, I feel it's, uh, it's, it's very important. Thank you. Um. We have a, a serious problem, particularly in the beginning teacher. Um, they hardly make a living wage when they're they're coming out making thirty two, thirty three thousand dollars, and they may have over a hundred thousand dollars in student loans. Uh, this is a, a serious problem, and squeeze. I've heard that word a lot here. <laughs> that we we have a finite budget again. And so we're going to have to really look how we allocate uh, our monies. And, uh, uh, but our beginning teachers, we have to encourage those folks to come into the profession uh, instead of going to other, other professions. Okay, our final question. Bill Wilson, first response, goes to Joe Murphy. Rochester has a long history of school board members who go after coaches. So I have a two-part question for you. It is, is it appropriate for school board members to actively engage in coaching selection decisions, or should that be the purview of administrators? And part two, do you have a target? Or anybody on that table plan to go after somebody when they get elected? Uh, that's a good question. Um, no, I, I think, uh, you know, I think it is important, um, you know, I think it's important when, when a school board member up here has a, a student that may be in that sport that, you know, they abstain from, from the decision making on the coaching. I, I do think that, you know, the, the, the board as a whole should probably have uh, less, of a, less of a decision on that. Um, it should be left, you know, up to the administrators, uh, the varsity coaches. Um, things of that nature. Uh, I do not have a target. Um, I, I coach with a lot of people and uh, I like you know, most of the coaches here. I don't know that I have a problem with any of them. School board members only have one employee and that's a superintendent. We don't go after coaches. We don't you know, go after teachers. We act on the recommendation of the superintendent. And that's either an up or down vote. And before a superintendent brings a decision like this to us, a lot of documentation is going into it, a lot of second chances, a lot of negotiation. So it's not, sometimes, you know, as a school board member, you're privy to uh, confidential information. And uh, it's kind of frustrating when we have a hearing that, uh, you know, we know stuff, but we can't say it. You know, it's all for the, uh, you know, the person's own uh, confidentiality. So when we have a hearing, I can see the frustration in the people in the crowd. And we usually have a prepared statement uh, produced by our lawyer. And that's the reason we have an attorney to do things properly to protect all people involved. So sometimes when a board makes a decision, it's because they know information that's not public. And you have to have some faith and trust in what their decision is. As far as coaching decisions, I think that's the responsibility of the administrators at the buildings and then um, ultimately the superintendent. Um, as far as personal opinions, we all have them. But on a board, your responsibility is to make sure that everybody's getting the education they're supposed to get. And you need to keep your personal opinions out of those situations. You're looking for the good of everybody. And I have no target. That's my kids all had good coaches, and I have no interest in even taking time to do that kind of thing. 
Yeah, the, the, the school board shouldn't play a part in that. There, there is a chain of command that needs to be followed as far as the coaches goes. And I don't I don't believe the school board, you know, is a part of that. Until They'll make it the very end. Um, so as far as complaints, that stuff, that all, all needs to go to the uh, to the proper chain of command. So um, as far as outsiders setting in on the hiring process, that, that that's a no-no in my opinion. Should should never happen. Um, let the administrators do their job, let them hire their coaches. Hopefully they'll support their coaches. Um, as far as a target as a coach, I, I have no targets as a coach. What they put up with and what they give to us is unbelievable. You know, I've been in coaching, you know, it, it's a thankless job. Um, you know, so no targets here. I, I, I support coaches and what they do and, and the influence that they have on our children. As far as uh, questions, I'm sad that you have to ask that question, but recently we have let a lot of coaches go. It's unfortunate, it's unacceptable, and it can't happen. We've got to be able to recruit good coaches to Rochester to get the best out of our kids and support those coaches. Um, as far as hiring a coach, you know, the school can have a committee um, involving administrators, uh, but I don't think the school board has any play at all in hiring coaches or interviewing coaches. I think they stay completely out of that. Um, I do think we need to have better processes in hiring coaches. Um, we can't just have one coach interview and him get hired, or we can't have um, somebody from the outside setting in, giving their input. I mean, that strictly needs to be within the school. As far as targets, I have no targets. Thank you. I have read the bylaws very, very carefully, and it is not in the school board's realm of responsibility to uh, be hiring coaches. And our, it is the superintendent and the administration that handles that. So um, I would not ever be involved in that, and I definitely don't have any grudges or anything else about the coaches. No targets. No targets. No targets. <laughs> no targets. <laughs> As others have said, that is not the function of the school board. The school board approves the recommendations, or I should say rules on the recommendations from the superintendent. And we are not, and have not been, actively involved in coaching. I will say what Tom has said in that, and that has been one of the biggest difficulties, honestly, in being a board member, is that we are privy to personnel information that we are not able to share. And so I ask that you vote for someone that you trust to make those wise decisions and know that you will not be able, the members of the public are not able to hear the full story because that is how it works. Okay, we'll wrap up here with closing statements. Reminder, these are two minutes per candidate. And our closing statements start with Tom Schwing. Okay. Okay, thanks for everybody for coming. And uh, the panel did an excellent job. And I hope this has been a good ex learning experience for the students, too. Uh, I think maybe we all start out with, you know, what's the job description of a school board member? And I've got a way that I kind of keep it simple. It's, it's just three things. Described as six words. Hire a superintendent, establish policy, and uh, protect the assets. Now, the first two are pretty, you know, you understand what those are pretty easy, but uh, protecting assets, we have human assets. We have students, teachers, and uh, staff. Physical assets, uh, buildings or land, buses, uh, you know, or sports facilities and uh, the financial assets, uh, bonds, uh, insurance, you know, our, our medical coverage, uh, all of our tax money, and, uh, and all the funds that uh, we manage. So to keep it simple, and that, you know, it just kind of helps remind you and keeps on track of what your job is. For 62 years, I've been a very proud member of this community, and, and for the last years, it's been my honor to represent all of you in the school. 
It is my hope that I've earned your respect and trust to support me in the next four years in the Rochester Community School Board. Thank you. I want to thank everyone, um, um, Mr. Stasiak and the students. Thank you for your questions. And just thank you for the opportunity to speak and for all of us to give our ideas and what we think on the different issues that came up. Um, as a school board member, it is the job of the school board to set things up so the teachers and the other people that are involved with the students, they can do their job and give them the best skills they can get to go out into the world and to be successful. It's the school board's job to set up that whole environment and make all these things so they can happen. Um, the corporation I was in, unfortunately, a lot of my ideas are coming from there. And one of the big things they had, they had this big triangle setting up in our buildings. And it had on one side equally lateral triangle, so everybody was equal. You got the schools, the teachers, and that. At the, you had the families and the students. Then you had the community. If all three of them are working together, you can have a very strong school system. And part of what the school board needs to do is set up so you've got a school system that is working for everybody and everybody can be proud of it. And I, I would like to be a part of making Rochester that kind of school system. We have a good school system that you can change and you can get better and you can get better. One of the things in education that we were always told when I was a teacher, change is always coming. You've got to be ready for it. You've got to be able to adapt to it. You've got to be able to provide the students for what the state wants them to have. Thank you. The reason for my candidacy has been driven by, a, by just some multiple concerns. I feel that we need more consistency in policy and procedures. We need a more logical approach to our building and facility maintenance and upkeep. And lastly, what most concerning is the amount of students we have lost in neighboring schools. Our school board has had several dealings with employee issues in the last year to year and a half. There not seem to be much consistency with termination dismissal procedures. I understand that we do not see the entire process, but it has driven me want to become more knowledgeable and involved so I better understand. My focus currently is the number of students who are leaving the school district to attend neighboring schools. We need, we need to address that. What are we lacking? What have we done incorrectly? What improvements can we make to keep these students and gain more students? Um, I see frustration among everyone, teachers, parents, kids. We lack in supporting a common goal. I see it at all levels. Administration, faculty, staff, parents, and students need to become more cohesive. In closing, I want to once again thank all of you who helped organize this event. I feel being able to represent Richmond Township as a school board member, I would offer several strengths that I have gained through my work knowledge and personal accomplishments. As a union steward at RMC, I was involved in three contract negotiations with board members. This process has taught me how to give and take, all while keeping the best interests of those I represent in mind. My position as foreman has taught me great troubleshooting skills, how to adjust to all different problems that arise, and to make decisions accordingly to do what is most effective, logical, with long-term goals in mind. I work alongside the public in my career, my business, my coaching. My goal is, my goal in each position is to benefit the most people possible in the best way available. I'm not only seeking this position with my family in mind, but with all community families in mind. Each of us has a responsibility to our children to provide the best opportunity. The kids, the future. I want to again thank everyone who made this debate happen. Tony for moderator, did a good job, Bill Wilson from the Sentinel, the AP government students, RTC for broadcasting it. I also want to let everyone know that there isn't one person on this panel who doesn't want what is best for Rochester Community Schools. We are truly blessed to have individuals at all levels of the school community who care about our kids today and are getting the best education possible. If elected and as a member of the Rochester School Board, I will bring youth, energy, and passion to the board. I will ask the tough questions that need asked. I will encourage the community to be more involved with our school. 
I will be fiscally responsible when making decisions that affect taxpayers in the community. I will represent the entire school community as a whole, not small groups or individual people. I will bring fresh eyes and new perspectives to tackle some important shortfalls facing our schools today. Most importantly within my role as a school board member, I will never make a decision that does not positively support our kids and teachers. Thank you. As I was reading those bylaws and policies and procedures, I happened upon the logo of, of Rochester Community Schools. And on that logo, of course, is our zebra. But it also said the mission of the school is to inspire individuals to learn, grow, and give. As a school board member, my job will be to make the mission, that mission possible through being fiscally responsible, through being well informed to promote effective policies and procedures, and lastly, through wisely guiding the one employee that the school board supervises, the superintendent. My motto as an educator for my entire life, no matter what the age of the student has been either from preschool to graduate school, is to put students first. And then you can always be proud of yourself in the end. I hope that you will support my candidacy for this position. It's kind of been a bit of a lifelong dream to uh, be on the school board. And as I near my kind of conclusion here with my uh, life at Ivy Tech, um, it will be nice if I could be on the school board. Thank you. Once again, thank you to the AP government class, to Mr. Wilson, RTC. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to exchange ideas, to learn more about the other candidates, so that the public may learn more as well. Most of all, it's been an honor to be a school board member for the last four years. It's been one of the experiences in my life that has challenged me the most, where I've grown the most, and hopefully given the most. And that is what our motto is, to learn, grow, and give. And I can assure you that as a board member, when we are making decisions, that is at the forefront of what we have been making decisions. We welcome new ideas, and I would be honored to have the opportunity to serve again. I again want to thank uh, Mr. Stasiak and the uh, AP government panelists, uh, Mr. Wilson and the Sentinel, uh, RTC, and, and WROI as well. Um, this is my first time doing this kind of thing, so this is uh, this has been a very interesting experience. Um, you know, I truly believe education is one of the most important gifts that we can give our children. Um, I'm also a firm believer in making sure that all students coming out of Rochester schools can be prepared for the future, whether that be college, trade school, workforce, or the military. Again, I would bring youth and fresh ideas to this board if elected, and I would make sure that our students and faculty always have the support and resources they need to be successful. My vision for education in our community would include a school environment that gives every student the opportunity to be success successful, whether that be more trade classes or continuing the Ivy Tech and AP classes, but also learn a learning environment that recognizes that not every student will learn best through project-based learning or a traditional learning model. I feel that providing a wide variety of learning styles is fundamental for the children. I envision a learning community that empowers and encourages all students and staff in every capacity and listens to the feedback of the teachers in the community. I would appreciate your support on November 6th. Thank you all for coming out. It's been an enjoyable evening. Please join me in a round of applause for the people on the stage. A few quick thank yous. Uh, the RHS custodians, Taylor Shawley, Lisa McMillan, and Alexis Coleman back there to help us kind of run the auditorium part of, of the stage, and Haley Wilson for uh, giving her time to sing the national anthem for us, uh, RTC for, uh, for partnering with us, uh, Bill Wilson, another, uh, another round of 
debates and we're, we're still hoping to possibly have a congressional debate if we can it's still in the works if we could do that possibly after fall break um, I'd also like to thank uh, the student panelists um, they, for their time they've done an outstanding job and uh, I think you get a brief glimpse of why I enjoy going to fifth hour AP every day I don't think we've had a bad day yet this year and I think that says a lot um, I'd also like to thank uh, the candidates uh, regardless of how this election turns out I thank each and every one of you for your time, your willingness to provide service for our school community, and, and thank you for all your efforts and that you've done today. Uh, the, the government teacher in me wants to make a few PSA reminders. Uh, election day is coming up, November the 6th. Uh, the registration deadline, if you have not registered to vote, is Tuesday, October 7th. And regardless of, of who you vote for and which candidates you favor, I hope that each and every one of you that are eligible do take the opportunity to vote on November the 6th. So I thank everyone uh, for your time tonight and have an enjoyable evening and go Zebras.